are at a very critical stage, not just in this country, uh, but in Europe as a whole. And whereas in some parts of Europe, Spain, as our friend from Podemos uh, explained, and Greece, uh, Syriza, and little pockets in the Irish Republic, where the progressive movements have made uh, leaps forward, really, uh, by and large, the picture in other parts of Europe is not great. In France, for instance, it is dire. We are in France virtually in the closing stages of a political civilization that began in 1789. The entire heritage of the movements from 1789 onwards, and you can, you know, uh, uh, take the years, are under heavy fire or have been subverted from within. And a peculiarly French form of neoliberalism, intellectually, ideologically, politically, economically, gains ground. The left, traditional left, is extremely weak. And a majority of young people openly say that they're voting for Le Pen. So it's not a situation which that we can be uh, you know, calm about. There are lots and lots of problems, which is why the good examples that are have to be learned from and used. Let me start with what I think is the single most important thing that has happened on these islands for a very long time. And that is what I refer to as the democratic uprising in Scotland. In fact, there should have been a speaker here next time, I hope, from the radical independence campaign in Scotland, which has fought an exemplary campaign, non-sectarian, sharp, canvassing organized very thoroughly in the working class estates of Glasgow, and one result of that has been that every single constituency in Glasgow, the biggest working class town in Scotland, voted for independence. So the notion that this was some petty bourgeois deviation led by crazy nationalists is nonsense, really. Even the so-called crazy nationalists had a program well to the left of the better together people. <laughs> and what we are witnessing in country after country is the existence of what I have labeled the an extreme center. And this center includes the center left and the center right, and their hangers on in country after country. It's the same, I mean, it takes different forms, the policies are the same. And they live largely within a bubble world kept going by the mass media, which uh, they control. And against this, one has to fight. And an important aspect of this struggle is to understand now, after all the decades in which we have been debating this issue with different tactics being put forward, that it is absolutely foolish to either have or to cultivate any illusions whatsoever in the social democratic parties of yesteryear. What is the difference between them, apart from on some cultural issues? Basically, very few. Some want to do the, do the same horrible things with a smile on their faces, and the others do it saying openly, yes, we're trying to crush the poor. Everyone has to suffer if we're going to get out of the crisis. And it's this campaign of fear being waged throughout Europe waged by the entire European Union leadership to try and frighten the Greek voters against voting for Syriza in the last general election. Unfortunately, it worked, and it worked largely with the older generation, scared, understandably, of who was going to pay the pensions, what was going to happen. But this campaign of fear worked in, in Greece temporarily. 
Once again, now we see Syriza effectively leading the polls. There's no doubt if there, an election is held within the next six months, there will be a, the Syriza will be the largest party in the Greek parliament. And the speed with, this has, with which this has happened, basically over the last five or six years, is astonishing. And what that tells us that the European electorate is in a very volatile mood. They are fed up with the existing political uh, parties and politicians. And in some countries, they punish people on the far left who are aligned to these parties. You can look at it. The big decline of Mélenchon's group in France, largely because they refused to break with the Socialist Party, whose president is now at 11%. Hated, despised, the lowest standing of a French president in, in recent decades. You see it in Portugal when an alliance of the left decided to vote for a social democrat as president and their ratings fell from 12% to 5%. So the lessons have to be learned and understood. And the fact that Podemos is currently on 20% in the opinion polls is precisely a reflection that they refuse to compromise with traditional politics and traditional politicians. And we have to learn from that. But there's another difference too, that in both Greece and Spain, Podemos and, to a very large extent, Syriza, though very different in origin, gained their strength from huge mass movements in the streets. There have been nine general strikes in Greece, nine to try and defeat the Troika. They didn't succeed, but they created a political current. Uh, our friend has pointed out already what happened in Spain from huge occupations of squares and public spaces, and not just that, but people from these groups going into some of the poorest areas in Madrid to help immigrants who are being going to be displaced and chucked out by the uh, cops. Many things like that have happened in Madrid and Barcelona. So, here in Scotland, by the way, this huge mass movement which arose, which was defeated again by a campaign of fear led by the Conservative Party and the Labour Party uh, and their hangers-on, including a few who should have known better. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> that's, what, that's how they won. And we now have the total breakdown of the Scottish vote. The demography is clear. It is the older voters, by and large, who preserve the status quo. Now, the important thing is that, you know, I have to say this even though I'm one of them, that they're not going to be there too long. <laughs> So the young are going to win ultimately in Scotland. And why that is important is not because one had any illusions in Alex Salmon or any of these people. They fought a good campaign, I'll say, and well to the left of the traditional parties. But the opening up of a new space within the United Kingdom, one of whose first plans was to get rid of the Polaris missiles, the Trident, which is based in Scotland, was discussed openly and publicly everywhere in Scotland. This was one big debate which took place in that country. And it would have made a huge difference. They'd have come here. And then we would have had to start and open up a debate. So movements leading to the creation of new type of political formations, broad, non-sectarian, including the left and many who are still in a process of transition are absolutely key to understand. If we don't do that, then we see what happens without big campaigns, not just on anti-war, which of course we're all in favor of, but on social issues, housing, medicine, education, but big campaigns to unite as many people as possible. That is the way 
I think, to build a movement in the non-Scottish parts of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Because that is what confronts us uh, uh, now. It's not going to happen by announcing it. For it, we need something huge from which such a party, a movement, grows organically. That is absolutely key. It would help if a few Labour MPs split finally from their wretched organisation and came over. I mean, I do not know what future Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and these others see for themselves in the party except being token leftists of one sort or another. What's the point when you see what Labour is up to at the moment? Not just on wars and imperialist adventures, but in this country where no one from that front bench has the guts to stand up and attack the Tories. So we have created, we live in a political culture where there is no progressive opposition on that scale. And then what happens, as always has happened in the past, groups arise on the right and the extreme right, which press on one issue, in this case, in the case of UKIP, immigration and the European Union, and they, they, they speak of English independence, and through a sleight of hand, no, they get away with it because no one ever asks them, if you are the UK independence party and you want to be independent of Europe, okay, that's debatable, we can discuss that as an issue, but that withdrawing from Europe won't make Britain independent.